Hello out there. This is Diane Funston, and this is Poetry Square, the January edition. Um, I'd like to say thank you, first of all, to Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture for producing this show and um, allowing poetry to come to Yuba Sutter and beyond. Now with Zoom, we certainly don't have to stay to one area, so it's a benefit in these uh, in these times during the pandemic. Tonight we have three featured poets. We have uh, Frank Judge, who comes to us from my hometown of Rochester, New York. We have Mark Fisher, who comes to us from Tehachapi, which is a rural mountain town up in the uh, mountains about an hour outside of Bakersfield. And we have um, Nick LaForce who comes to us from down the road in Sacramento. And uh, we have varied voices tonight and it should be a good program. Um, I'm gonna start. And I was thinking of January and winter poems. And um, I do have a couple of winter poems, but here in the Sacramento Valley, we don't have much of a winter. So I'll give you the best I can as far as memories go. So this one is called Winter. Back east, winter is long, white, and cold. Icicles like daggers drawn threaten, hang from rafters. Gargoyles leer with sharp teeth. Silence punctuated with steady snowplows makes days long lonely and gardens lifeless. Almost pagan-like, small signs of spring are cause for wild celebration. Hymns of gratitude for tree buds or crocus calling forth the sun and feeling warmth, renewal of all things dormant and dull. Here in the Sacramento Valley, Sonambulant gardens are jarred awake. No slow mo motion, but standing to attention. Those previously at ease languid leaves who never bothered to shed or freeze, but suddenly burst into bloom easier than in the strong heat of summer. Sweet scent of cut grass awakens my memories from those dark days of past winters to this short, mild resting period, we have between our seasons of fertile, active fruition. This brief hiatus we absurdly call winter. And this next poem, um, which we certainly don't have this year, this year we're actually um, I believe they have called it a, a drought already for the area. Um, but a couple of years ago, they had the term atmospheric river, and we had a lot of rain, uh, record-breaking rain here. And this one is called Atmospheric River. Walking in Northern California rain, snug under a plastic poncho, I'm bothered neither by wet or wind. Brave dogs at my side, we straddle puddles and gutters to get our daily exercise, despite the downpours 10 days straight. Our snowpack is secure after years of drought and dust. Forecast calls for atmospheric river, the latest in dramatic terms to excite the media addicted sedentary class. I continue my walk, tree limbs wave, our pace reflected in standing water. And uh, when I lived in the Tehachapi area, where one of our readers comes from, Mark Fisher, I would drive from Tehachapi to um, Round Mountain, Nevada, where I spent a few years for my husband's work and drive back and forth through Bishop and Lone Pine and that area. And this is about that, uh, it was a very windy area. 
driving towards home. Three hours to go, coming from lonely highways, over mountain passes, through rural towns. Relax drive, audiobook novel, dogs asleep in backseat sun. Startled as too soon awakened, wind whirls through lone pine. Dust shakes out dirty sheets across road, blinds, screams, tears down vacancy signs. None slows for traffic. Peeled off metal panels from gas station pumps, cartwheel across parking lots where gasoline hoses dance like cobras on asphalt. Jacket hood pasted to my head, I heard my dogs into car from the rest stop, pull out onto road, slowly. I drive with hands welded to steering wheel, chassis swings, bumps, gyrates, wind throws a confetti of leaves, celebrates my cautious return to concrete coliseum to face roaring velocity in my unarmed armor of car. I pass through Lone Pine, Dodge debris, now filled with gasoline and determination. I head slowly towards home. The gusts fade with the miles. I soon halt as I drive to Olancha. The road is mine again. Speed picks up. I am on my way faster, back in the race I always have with myself. Every time I return across 357 straight yellow lines, weather toward home to Hatchapi, nothing gets in my way. And uh, I was thinking of poems to read and I thought about my dogs and I have quite a few dog poems. And uh, this first one, um, is called Communion, and it's about picking out our first dog years ago after living in an apartment complex that didn't allow dogs, and it's called Communion. Walking the green mile of kennels, I am drawn to the center cell block, framed by chain link diamonds, a crown of thorns pattern of silver and rust. A red-brown dog occupies the square. The worn information sheet reads, Bud. A turned-in stray, long past puppyhood, after cute outside paws raised pillars to hugeness. Bud's eyes look to the floor in silent vespers. I lean down, offer my hand in communion. Cautiously, his vulcanized nose seeks my scent. His stretch of neck turns to trust as I massage furloughed muscles, tense but loosening, like petals from tight blossoms. His eyes find mine. A brown backwash pulls me in to memories of past dogs, of strays, of alone, of home. We both rise, rattling forged links of cage. Bud anoints my fingers with warm tongue, a baptism back to the present, to absolution. I unclip his information sheet, take it to the counter, another soul saved. And Bud was a great dog. He was a German Shepherd and Great Dane mix. He was very large. And this one is for my little Athena, who's a Chihuahua mix. And uh, this is called Athena. She springs liquid fast, white black streak across brown backdrop of yard. Dainty paws at ends of leggy limbs. She sprints upstairs, rushes into room. Tiny feet tiptoe, then dash for limp sock. She shakes it alive before killing it over and over. One ear up, one down, next day switched. Black marble eyes alert for mischief. She tires, stilled in slumber, 
beneath a chin, atop a shoulder, immersed in blankets, enmeshed in my heart, young again. And um, this next one was for um, our first pit bull that we had, Emily. And Emily was white with black spots. She went to work with me to work with adults with um, developmental disabilities. She rode in the van and uh, she was rescued from the desert. And um, this is about her. Her name was Emily after Emily Dickinson because she was all in white. Elegy for Emily. Emily lies beneath the Japanese maple, heavy in her pine box, buried in the garden she loved amidst oaks and shade from balustrade. We five at the side of her lowering, words said, dirt shoveled, tree planted, the disturbed earth tamped down, water soaking, coaxing roots to embrace her. Each visit home brings her memory, a glimpse of her white form roaming lawn, her ghostly smile circling in wind, eyes alight with playful expectation. The tree buds early this spring, life fills the property in birdsong, iris carved headstone placed proper, copper wind chimes a tune to and fro. Our Emily, many months gone, lives on in the landscape, her pit bull heart grown still, her silent tongue red as Japanese maple. And on the subject of pit bulls, we now have our, our second one, um, Kira. And this is a, a poem called Breed Specific. You will never win in a fight with a pit bull. They will tear you to pieces with a dark liquid square stare. In a quick flash, they will pierce your heart with devotion so deep, it will halt previous judgment, leaving you with loyal canine friendship. To know the pit bull smile is to witness the pure joy of bonding with a breed maligned by man and media. With rubbery lipped laughter, they lean against your leg, barely tired after a fast run or climbing hike through wilderness. I have been lucky enough to love too. Emily, white spirit, rescued from desert abuse, who became a working dog, exchanging smiles with people with handicaps. She led them up Red Rock Canyons, rode the transport bus shotgun, wagged greetings morning and evening, breed ambassador, 13 years, now a white angel returned home. Kira, abandoned to a desert dog pound, red nose, burnished brown bouncer, with a short muscular body, tireless in pursuit of affection. She allows her chihuahua companions first crack at kibble, second at climbing in car, young with years ahead, Nevada's loss, like so many who leave the silver state for better. And this, uh, this one is called For God Without Naming Him. The huge coastal redwoods aim to reach you, try as they might, falling short. Ferns and sorrel bow at your presence as they stretch upward between mighty trunks to catch a glimpse of their creator. The world ocean ebbs and flows with tides, prayers and chants, the call and response of the sacred. 
Rain falls from the sky like almighty tears of gratitude. Snow allows for a fasting of the land from warmth and growth, revitalized with spring and its communion of renewal, while autumn offers the benediction for retreat. We do not always see your miracles. We are accustomed to immediacy. You did not arrange your world that way. Blessings take time to appreciate. They take time to see them for what they are. Miracles are in all walks of life. Your works do not bend to organized religious dogma. You bring light to the darkest of forests and hope to the tiredest eyes. Humility allows us second chances and do-overs. Pride and blasphemy always make for spiritual pollution. Impeding growth in the light and ability to thrive, something the redwoods and the ferns have already figured out. And we'll be going to our first featured poet, uh, Frank Judge. Thank you, Diane. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, and I uh, guess I'm the I'm the East Coast representative this this month. Uh, my first poem, it's called uh, Eight Views of a Ghost," and it was inspired by an actual true incident. I was uh, in a in a chain restaurant, and uh, I saw a book that someone had abandoned. I guess. And I picked it up, figuring, well, if they abandoned it, I guess I can take it. I know the author. I mean, I know of the author. And uh, when I leafed through the book, it turned out to be a book of mine that had been inscribed to me by the author several years earlier. So uh, that incident seemed creepy enough to uh, inspire this poem. Eight Views of a Ghost. One. The ghost has just enough substance to make trouble in a world where he can only be seen what he wants when he wants to be. Two, the ghost, of course, is white when he chooses to appear. He loves the snow because it's the color of his world. Three, the ghost plays tricks on me, leaving books in waiting rooms where I open them to find my name inscribed by the author on the title pages. Four, the ghost has a mate and they watch me spending my nights alone with only my thoughts of a lover. Five, at night I fall into dreams and soon the ghost has joined me and turned dreams into nightmares or joy as suits his fancy. Six, the room grows cold as the ghost nears. My lover says she can see him out of the corner of her eye, never directly. So he's gone when she turns to see him. Seven, on Father's Day, the ghost lures me to my father's grave with a sunny afternoon, and I forget the distance between us when he was alive. Eight, many times the ghost has promised he'd leave, but he's remained there in the distance, in the corner of the room, in the next room by the window, looking at me, looking through him, casting the hint of a shadow. My next poem, it's called Cape Light. Hold on just a sec. I don't know what just happened to Cape Light. It just disappeared. I'll, I'll read. Uh, I found when I was preparing for this, uh, I had three poems with the same title. The, the title was Rain. And uh, I'm going to read all three of them because they're quite short. Rain settles over me like night as I imagine you and sun somewhere white and blue, relaxed in a perfect tan. 
Before you, I had always run from the rain into bright rooms filled with people. Our days rush back now when the sadness of slate skies and wet black highways vanished like some biblical revelation. Suddenly there was only the light of your smile, the warmth of your hand in downpours, a secret sun gleaming within us, promising to last forever, but instead running backwards, leaving me alone with only hints of undiscovered memories. This is rain too. In the villages during the rainy season, leaves, rubbish, the remains of insects, and even thought would float down the deep paths and streams, washed away to someplace else. We passed the time indoors, the smoke rising up and out the open hole in the roof. At night, we watched the moon with wide eyes and went to bed early holding each other in the dark, exploring the unknown future. This is brain three. Outside, the day is bright with sunshine and hope. In here, it's raining, dark rain that brings no moisture, but vanishes as quickly as if the house were made of sand, and stones. I warn you about this, but you insist it makes no difference. It's always raining one way or the other. What does one say to such reasoning that may or may not be true, but contradicts the reality that there would be no rain here now, if not for you and the clouds you carry with you? The next one is called Small Details. It was part of a contest. They're not a contest, I'm sorry. It was, a, it was selected to be used for a, an organization uh, here in Rochester as, as one of their featured poems that would be uh, broadcast on, on a phone booth that passersby could pick up a, the phone in a phone booth and uh, and listen to the poem, or, and not this poem, but and among many poems. Small details. Weekends, we meet at the cabin on the lake. I love the drive down to reach you, past birch, oak, maple, chestnut, and rare elm. But today, I heard the voices in the trees whispering, look closer and to the untrained eye your glasses by the bed on an opened book the folds in the comforter the angle of the phone on the alcove table the order of the coffee jars in the pantry all look innocent enough but as you stand framed by the door sunlight tracing the curves of your body through your linen dress. I see a shadow pass over your face. And no, I am not alone in your heart. <clears throat> I've been interested in film for many, many years since the, my college years. And eventually I became a, a film critic I was always interested in uh, Italian neorealism, post-World War II film movement that was filmed largely on location, if you will. So this is a, a tribute to those films. It's called Neorealist. This is a world that can only be black and white, like the memories of those years, like we remember news photos. In this world, it's always Sunday, the streets nearly empty. A dog trots down a sidewalk, hugging the buildings. A figure in the distance walks away from us. On a cross street, a car passes, 
that we never see again. Bells of some church ring, though no parishioners ever appear. We follow a man or woman or child towards crisp new buildings that look empty. No clothes on any lines, no figures on the balconies, no movement behind the windows. Buildings here don't touch. They stand alone and far apart, forming entire neighborhoods of quiet emptiness. The light, the vistas, tell our eyes and hearts these are real streets in a real time gone by. But we hope such a world only existed on film. It's unbearable to think of people living in a landscape of such loneliness where Monday never comes and there may not even be any hope beyond the white horizon. That was specifically a tribute to uh, the great filmmaker, uh, Vittorio De Sica. This is a film called, this is a film, <laughs> this, is a, this is a poem called Blackbirds. Sort of an experiment, if you will, in, in surrealism, I guess you could call it. It's called Blackbirds. He leans against the black tree, bloated with blackbirds, each of them visible in the late autumn sun. He imagines himself in a painting, maybe some descendant of Bruegel. At times like this, he dreams of faces and cars, trains and buses, and doorways he's passed. Names and numbers he's forgotten, maps he's lost. Once it was all too easy for him. Now he can't imagine anything falling neatly into place. At the edge of the park, our, <clears throat> our cyclist children, couples strolling, beautiful women glowing beneath their coats, women who could redeem anyone with a glance or a touch. A stiff breeze cuts through him. He feels invisible. The birds stir and fall turning into wet black leaves, forming a perfect circle on the black earth around him. This one's called, I read this uh, Sunday at another reading, so some of you are familiar with it, uh, but I, I've been asked to read it again, so I'll do so. It's called The Spy Awaits the Biopsy Results. I've written over the past 20 or 30 years, a bunch of spy poems. The spy could be a man or a woman. Um, it's, it's basically a, a persona, if you will. Not a, not a me, but just a person that uh, represents, represents mankind, if, if you will. He knows enough of secrets to know bad news never comes quickly. It seems months now, but maybe just a week. It's so quiet he hears the leather desk clock ticking and footsteps clicking in the halls where the day moves on without a trace of danger. Beyond the discreet blinds, the sky fills with dark birds he sees swooping down to tear at him as he lies face down at a deserted crossroads and France or Italy, taking parts of him off to trees that care nothing of him or his life of or his life. He's often sat calmly in rooms like this, disinfected white or softly paneled, with books providing the illusion of security. Rooms of absolution or condemnation. Rubbing his glasses, he's waited patiently for stories to finish before lifting a phone and ordering others off to certain death or torture. Even now, he suspects malignant armies are marshalling against him at invisible borders. 
retribution for a life of deceit and indifference. He knows the routine. In a moment, a door will silently open, confirming the invasion, a war whose options will all be unacceptable. What questions will he ask? What stories can he tell to excuse his negligence, the crimes long past undoing or forgiving? He calculates if maybe there's some place he can escape to, some new identity to assume and eke out one, two, ten more birthdays under a tropical sky and delay the consequences of his life. He recalls Dr. Faustus wishing himself turned into air or drops of water to escape Lucifer, then realizes he'd be found no matter what. I don't really have time for another poem, so I guess I will cede my remaining time to uh, our next reader, Mark Fisher. Hello and welcome to my studio here in Tehachapi, California. Um, got a collection of poems that I want to read tonight. Uh, the first one actually was published just yesterday on the True Vale Review. It's uh, a raven perches on the streetlight pole looking down and mocking me, attached to the ground as I am. He's unable to walk that mile in mine, as I am to soar the winds as him, suffering each our own self-importance, our alien worlds overlapping right in my front yard. And as was mentioned, I uh, live at the very southern end of the Sierra Nevada. And the next one uh, is Spring in the Mountains. Broken hopes this winter bring, the sky itself broken and gray, looking forward into spring. About the mountain slopes still cling, snows untouched by sun's ray, broken hopes this winter bring. Snowbirds each morning start to sing, migration taking them on their way, looking forward into spring. Bear cubs this year's offspring come out of dens to see the day, broken hopes this winter bring. Wildflowers waken across everything, all their colors on display, looking forward into spring. Life still spills from its wellspring, striving still against dismay, broken hopes this winter bring, looking forward into spring. Uh, this next one uh, was also published on the Truvale Review um, last summer, so it's a little more summary. Uh, it's called Full of Stars. It's another summer sunset and stars begin to remember their names, where the scent of roses and mimosa waft lazily through muggy air behind a tumble-down garage holding someone else's memories, clouded like a, the empty sky that ain't quite dark despite the hour and the lingering heat of that long-ago summer day laid out with comic books and sandwiches under a tree my crumpled memories dangling on clotheslines and swing sets waiting for a me that's just as faded as this sunset sky now filled with stars. All right, uh, this next one, uh, another short one. Um, thinking about the world today, it's called Afraid. 
I've dropped into some odd Twilight Zone episode of a mad little village playing metaphor for a whole country as little boys get bandaged after fights beneath stars, debased by the change of not looking up as they fail to see that fear has made them into monsters. All right. Uh, next one is called Magpie. Once I knew an angel with magpie wings. She'd sing to the moon's blue shadows across her necropolis in a voice that tasted of butter, words that were soft like drifting cobwebs, draped about apocryphal landscapes, mere fever dreams trapped in amber, both eldritch and banal, separating communion in moonshine and white bread like a kind of hug, inheriting innocence and the promise of escape, free of the graveyard dust, floating on the scent of brimstone and lilies, in a gondola steered by a machine, weeping with ebb tide on the sea of her truth, on the verge of growing up. All right, uh, this one is from a couple of years ago. Um, actually, it was first published uh, in 2017 and then republished uh, in 2018. And it's called From the Institute of Quantum Poetry. I am, or perhaps not. I can't know until the wave state collapses, scratched out in some kind of cosmic seismograph, marking out the vibrations of this world, or not, with leptons superimposing, passing through my eyes, outwards to observe and change, either direction or magnitude, for each attempt to measure what it means to be. As Monday morning philosophers speak out, telling tales out of time, to come close, too close, to touching on singular truths, only to be drawn down beneath that horizon into whatever exists in information space filled with the rattling of dice and the hope of a saving throw against the illusion of existence. Okay. This next one is the American Kaiju. Beneath uneasy slumber, dreams an ugly dream that spins like satellites through that streaky bacon sky that spreads out good news like a virus of self-fulfilling misery, exhaling heartbreak and breathing in gloom with hypothetical fog that sweeps away gods and loosens the wing nuts, holding down the madness, resting on the elderly greatness and distant memories of happiness, drowning out the mournful cries of children Still, you're incapable of being the hero, dropping atom bombs and the true miracle of evolution. As next, we shrink down into the quantum realm to tussle with Schrodinger about what we really are. Okay. All right. Okay, the next one is actually somewhat physically difficult to read, so I'm going to give it a try. Um, this is Frankenstein. This electric loves life's purpose. There have been sparks across my brain, the burn of something dangerous. Up the dynamo to power the circuits, the lightning's power to sustain. This electric loves life's purpose. The heat of your blood beneath epidermis, warmth, a need I couldn't explain, the burn of something dangerous. Though they have no hope to deter us, 
by God or devil we've been ordained. This electric loves life's purpose. Alloyed within this furnace, tempered by our pain, the burn of something dangerous. It doesn't matter that they'll curse us and we'll be remembered as insane. This electric loves life's purpose, the burn of something dangerous. All right. The next one I'm going to read is the title poem from the uh, e-chat book that I had that just came out. Um, it's available. There hopefully will be a link somewhere that you can find. Uh, it's a free download. This is called Rain and Other Fairy Tales. Jorge found his dragon in the bottom of a bottle. We watch, Jorge the dragon and I, as a maiden in Samite crosses the dry soda lake, dragging her bloody sword in a line through the salt that stretches on past the cloudless horizon. In one point lost perspective, like the white lined freeway where Jorge the dragon and I Watch motorcycles, ride past ravens in the sky, heading to neon-signed Vegas to pay for other people's rain with their own sin. As our lost Guinevere sleeps in Lancelot's bed, remembering, Jorge the dragon and I watch the lady in the lake bed kicking up salt into La Elaine's still bleeding wounds. Up in those mountains, in some hole in the wall where she still waits. We don't know no Avalon, Jorge the dragon and I. In this land of little rain, just all the places the gold hunters left behind. Empty, dry, and haunted, with no once and future to look to, save the dunes and the heat. Because the rain won't come again for Jorge the dragon and I. All right. Let's do another desert one. Um, while Tehachapi lies barely in the Sierras, it's also right next door to the Mojave Desert. This one is simply called Mojave. Empty miles of sand and stone and hidden wildflower seeds where twisted Joshua trees cast their shadows onto the dry and dusty memories of the seas they used to be. As ravens imagine their seagulls calling to the mirage's waves, washing across desert varnished basalt, covered in petroglyphs, whispering stories in forgotten languages from before the awareness of gold drew the tsunami and the flotsam of the storm, leaving holes and metal cans across the desert bed, now crossed with off-road scars and torn up creosote, and still years are piling up as the faults slowly move, while the desert dreams it's a sea once again. There's the one. And it may not be clear, but the accent is Oklahoma. A little bit of Texas, maybe. So I am coming to California from something quite different, but I've been out here many years now. So this looks like this will be my last one. 
California. I'm a weed patch oaky, a red dirt poet, far from those tick infested post oak tangle woods with gully washer creek beds and only man made lakes filled by wall cloud thunderstorms rumbling across the sky like ghosts of forgotten buffalo. Yet my words still carry flashbacks of a grandmother's voice who lived back there somewhere. Still remembered from the Dust Bowl diaspora that brought families on the edge of ruin through the Mojave to a place of transformation. Forgetting Wichita's and Washita's when we saw Sierras and Sequoias, becoming lost in the back road and highways, lost in the dreaming here where the future was born again. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening tonight. And uh, our next poet is Nick LaForce. Hello, and uh, I'm happy to be here. I want to say thank you to the Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture and to Diane for inviting me to participate in Poetry Square and to be a part with such a, a you know, brilliant uh, group of poets here. Uh, I call myself a transformational poet because the poetry that I write is mainly for personal growth workshops that I've been in and my own personal growth and to help people with their personal growth. I wanna start with one that I wrote back in 2003, um, which is really about the journey from the head to the heart called Sacred Relics, and it came in part, I was inspired in part by a book by Philip Cosano called The Art of Pilgrimage, which advocated the idea that all of life can be a pilgrimage if you make your daily journey a sacred act. So this uh, poem, Sacred Relics, was inspired by that. I don't know when I lost my footing on the earth or when I moved upstairs from the heart to the lofty places where ideas dance. I don't know how many steps I must take to make the pilgrimage back to the Holy Land, but I do know the longing for something that cannot be named, the missing of something unknown, as if the day calls me, calls me out to play, because I was once eager to go outside, I once knocked on the doors of friends uninvited. I once moved in my body as if I belonged there. But here I am now in the middle of my life with duties to be done and chores to be completed. When the pilgrim comes knocking on the door of my heart, bringing sacred relics of the life I have not yet lived, ready to take me even as I am, if I am willing to find my way down the stairs and open myself to life once again. I think it's so true. We don't know when the pilgrim's going to knock on the door of our heart, but when it does, if we have the courage, we can step out into a new presence in life. And that really is, I think, for me, what it means to make that journey from the head to the heart. Next poem I want to share is called Endless Horizon. I wrote this, this poem when I was in Perth, Australia. I was doing a training. I was in the afternoon. A colleague of mine was teaching in the morning. And I had the privilege to walk on this beautiful tan sand beach looking out at this incredible blue ocean and blue sky. And they both met off in the distance, almost blending into each other as if this horizon went on forever. And I wrote this poem, Endless Horizon. As I was walking on the beach, I got this, this question that came to mind. It was, is the horizon you envision for yourself big enough to hold your dreams? And that was sort of the seed of this poem. On a clear day, the ocean offers an endless horizon, an edge to the world beyond which you cannot see and has no perceivable destination, a mystery 
to ancient mariners who sailed the unknown seas in search of undiscovered lands or seeking mythic treasures because the ocean edge is wide enough for all you might imagine. It speaks to that part of you that longs to know what's around the corner, what's over the hill, what's beyond the edge. That part of you that knows there is more to life than you have allowed yourself to live. If you squint and stretch your eyes to the farthest margin as if to peer over the edge of your own horizon, you will begin to wonder what lies beyond the rim of possibility you have set for yourself. You will hear the tireless crash and roar of wave after wave battering at your beach, crumbling belief into sand, dropping the shells of what no longer lives in you on the shore and asking you over and over, is the horizon you envision for yourself big enough to hold your dreams? And your heart knows the answer. Your heart knows when the life you live won't let you live your life. Your heart knows when the tides of change come from the deep, deep sea, from the unknown depths in you that support an endless horizon. And then on one clear day, you will stand on the shore and see for yourself all things possible. I like to think that uh, our horizon is really the set of ideas and beliefs we've formed about life that limit our possibilities or that hold us back from our bigger dreams. And if we can expand that horizon, then we may be able to create incredible possibilities in our life. Next poem I want to share is called Awakening. And uh, this is actually in a book that uh, I was originally going to call Awakening. I eventually retitled it divine whispering. And the reason I retitled it is because when I looked up the title Awakening, uh, there are like thousands of books out there with that title. So I thought I'd shift it. So it actually was the, the centerpiece for this, uh, for my third book of poetry, which is called Divine Whispering. The poem is called Awakening. The real awakening is not an awakening to your day, but an awakening to your life. It occurs with the gradual casting of light on the glorious mess of your life, when you realize no matter how brightly you shine, you will still cast a shadow. When you know no matter how carefully you tread, you will still leave dirty footprints in the lives of others. When you recognize the only way forward is to walk with your head held high, even though you will likely fall short of the mark and you may never quite fulfill your promise. You awaken when you know the next step you take will land you right in the middle of that glorious mess that you call your life. And you take the step anyway, unconditionally, wholeheartedly, because there is nowhere else you would rather land than in your own life. I think that's so true of many of us that uh, the journey of our life is actually coming to arrive in our life and live our life as more whole and full beings, getting beyond all the expectations that we've taken on of the world or our family or others, our own ideas about what we should do and actually living the life that's ours. And I think that's probably my biggest mission in life is to step out of, or st actually I should say step into my life, step out of those expectations and really live an authentic life. Next poem I want to share, I wrote in Hawaii. I was in a poetry writing workshop and um, there was this uh, walkway along the beach that uh, had some houses along it that had burned. And one of them was a shell of a house. There were three walls left, but it had burned down and there were actually some flowers there, um, probably in commemoration of people that, that died. And when I saw that house, I, I got this idea of how passionate our life could be that sometimes passion can actually burn our house down, so to speak. And, uh, and also the beauty and power of passion. So I wrote this, it's called Full in Love. I burn the midnight oil 
and then kick the lantern over, bringing down the house and laying waste to this oasis I built on dreams. I rip out the canvas on which I paint my world and feed it to the fire. I burn the journals I use to keep my life at bay. I tear off the pan gloss I preach, pry off the sullenware and I hide underneath and then fling myself naked into the flames. I give myself another second chance and then another and another and each time I rise up from the flames brighter and bolder, burning away all the plague and poison I inflict on myself. I want pure me, the distilled moonshine, the liquor of my life in a potency that cannot be measured. I want to live drunk on the divine, inebriated by beauty, God intoxicated and walking on the earth like a fool in love. And for me, I think that's where the journey of life really leads to that place where we can actually live in love, walk through our days in love, experience life from that place of being in love. But of course, that also means that uh, we open our heart to being touched and being broken, um, to being uh, exposed, so to speak. So it's a difficult journey and not one that we can obviously do all the time, but to move in that direction is always for me a, um, a challenge, I guess, that I give myself. Next one I wanna share is uh, going on with the full theme um, is called No Defense no defense. And uh, Frank had mentioned in his reading about a ghost and the wonderful story about the book that had his <laughs> signed off to him in it. I love that. Um, to me, I've always had this sense of a angel or presence in the background and this uh, idea. I call, actually call it the, suit, the, the secret chair, this kind of presence that's always with me as I go through my life. And no defense is really about connecting with that presence. The full in me lives on the edge of falling and easily becomes the shape of all things in the landscape of love. With this gift of entering, of shape-shifting into the world, I feel the preciousness of our struggle to be human as we divine our way through our lives. How many times must I die and be born before I embrace my own nakedness, that I have no defense against life? that I cannot stop the tidal wave from drowning us all or prevent my wingless heart from flying to you. If I could trace it all back to the source before the first birth or find my way beyond the last death, would I then disappear from the mirror? Or would the mirror disappear and reveal the strange angel who has loved me through it all? Actually, part of that poem was inspired by this image I had of my mother many years ago. My mother was fiercely protective of us children. And uh, I had this image that came to me of my mom standing there, holding her hands up to this tidal wave that was coming. And we, my brother and sister, we three kids were behind her. And she was holding up her hands as if she could stop the tidal wave of life from flowing over us. And um, the poem is really about realizing we can't stop that tidal wave. It will, in fact flow over us. And I'll end with uh, one last poem I often end my workshops with, which is called We Are Messengers. We are messengers. We may leave our footprints on the earth, but we walk in heaven. Our light shines farther than our own vision. Our words sink deeper than our own wisdom. We teach what you have lived before does not determine who you may become. And we are learning to live a simple truth of the heart. What we see in others, we awaken in ourselves. We become what we give to the world. About six months after I wrote that poem, my mother passed away and I had an opportunity to read it at her funeral. And as I uh, read that poem, and especially when I got to the line, we become what we give to the world, I looked around that room and I saw people whom my mother had touched or who had touched my mother. And I knew in that moment, her presence in a palpable way, probably even more profoundly than many times when I had been in her, been with her in the real world, um, I felt that presence in that moment. And I knew it, the, the truth of that. We become what we give to the world. 
So may you go out there and uh, with new eyes and see what you wish to see in others. See the best in them, because when we see in others, we awaken in, your, in ourselves. So thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to be with you here tonight and look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you at another event in the future. So I'll turn it back over to the Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture. Thank you. Thank you to all my uh, poets tonight. This is a wonderful reading and uh, very inspiring words, very different voices and very inspiring. And please join us again next month um, where our readers will be Stan Rubin and Ruth Nolan and John Wessick. And I'd like to thank everyone again that read tonight. And I'd like to thank our behind the scenes uh, woman, Shantae Royo. And most of all, I'd like to thank Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture um, for um, producing this show and supporting me as their poet in residence for this year and supporting poetry and the arts in general. And with as many opportunities that we've lost uh, through the pandemic this year, we have certainly gained a lot um, in online programming. And again, thank you for joining us and hope to see everybody next month.